you have questions about growing plants from seed. And I'm going to try to answer them today. Hi everyone, I'm Erin and this and this is the Impatient Gardener. I grow in Zone 5 in southeastern Wisconsin and through these videos and blog posts and social media posts, my goal is to educate and inspire gardeners of all skill levels and uh, just be part of a great gardening community. If you're new here and you are interested in more gardening content and everything that's going to be coming up this year because we all know the gardening season, we are just getting going folks. Um, hit that subscribe and the notification bell so you don't miss a video and hopefully we can go on this gardening journey together. All right, let's get right into it. So I reached out on uh, YouTube a week ago or so and asked everyone to share with me your questions about growing plants from seed and you guys delivered. Holy smokes, um, such good questions. Um, and we're going to try to get through of almost all of them today. Anything that started coming in after I started working on the answers won't be in this video. So in preparation for this video, I have consumed less coffee than usual because I'm going to try very hard to not talk so much uh, in my answers so that we can whip through a ton of questions. Now, rather than break this into a couple videos, which I think makes it harder for people to find the answers they want, I'm grouping all the questions by sort of general theme and I'm going to put chapters in the video description. So if you are looking for an answer to a specific problem, which is probably going to be covered here, um, you can just go to skip ahead to that chapter and all those chapter markers are in the description. Also in the description will be oodles of links to other videos that I've done, other videos that other people have done, other sources you might be interested in for anything that might help you in this. And then if at the end of this video, I still have not answered your question, Feel free to leave it in the comments and we'll try to get it answered either in the comments or possibly in a future video. Which vegetables and perennials should I start from seed and which should I buy from a plant? Okay, I'm starting with this question because I think this is the most important thing. Keep in mind, you don't have to grow from seed. You can be a fabulous gardener and never grow a plant from seed. There's nothing wrong with that. These are the three reasons why I grow anything from seed. Number one, and possibly the most important, is that I get bored and I just want to garden. I'm not going to lie. I get bored in winter. I'm desperate for to get my hands on some plants. And next thing you know, I've got a thousand seedlings in my basement. Two, when you grow from seed, you have a lot more options at your disposal. There are varieties or specific types of plants that you're just not going to find in a nursery somewhere. So... Sometimes if you are picky about the variety you're growing or a specific plant, you will have to grow from seed. And three, you might recognize a significant cost savings by growing from seed. Um, this to me particularly applies when you're growing a lot of plants of the same plants. Um, keep in mind though, you have to factor in all the other costs that are involved in seedlings, which is all the equipment, electricity, things like that. So a lot of things to be factored in there. So when I'm looking at an annual or a vegetable that I want to grow, um, perennials are a little bit of a different topic that we, can, we will certainly get into. But the things I look at as to whether I'm going to start this from seed or buy a plant are, do I just feel like doing it? This goes back to number one. Do I, am I just bored? I just feel like doing it for whatever reason. Um, can I get this variety as a plant? Or if I want this, I'm going to have to grow it for myself. Or how many of these do I really need? Since I've started growing a lot of things uh, or planting a lot of things sort of in bulk, um, it would not be cost effective for me to go out and buy 30 Nicotiana plants. And I use that many and probably more in my garden every year. So that would not be cost effective. A package of seeds in which you probably get a thousand Nicotiana seeds because they're the tiniest little seeds ever. You know, obviously there's a cost savings there. But sometimes um, with vegetables in particular, I mean, how many zucchini plants do you need? Because if you only need one, it's still cheaper to buy the plant than it is to buy the packet of seeds. And most people are just fine with one zucchini plant. For perennials, I factor in how long it will take for that plant to develop and flower. And for me with perennials, it is a factoring in the time it takes to grow that. And keep in mind that many perennials 
um, do really well from division. So for me, the time money balance might make a lot more sense if I buy a perennial, grow it for maybe a, two or three years, and then divide it. Because it would have taken three years probably to get a plant from seed to the size that original plant I was. So I'm a couple years ahead of the game there. Okay, a lot of questions about people who are able to get their seeds to germinate and then something goes wrong. Seedlings die or they just don't ever make it out to the garden or when they try to get to the garden, something bad happens. So we're going to deal with these in a group. I'm going to put those questions that sort of pertain to that on the screen right now. So this is all about, you know, seedlings, especially when they're stretching, things like that. Seedlings need three things. They need light. They need a specific temperature. Sometimes it's specific to that plant or a range and water. And anytime you see a spindly or weak seedling, you are more than likely dealing with a light problem. And that light problem is that you need more of it. So if you have grow lights, move them down. You've got to get those grow lights closer to where the plants are. And if you see your seedlings bending, that is a sure sign that they are seeking light. So that means that they're either bending to your light, you just have to get that light closer to them. Now, if you're using grow lights, if you're talking about fluorescent bulbs, this will mean like two inches above the plants, basically. If you're doing LEDs, there is a huge amount of factors that go into this, and LEDs, generally speaking, are more powerful, but there's it's a very complicated topic, which we'll touch on. But you're gonna have to play around with it. With an LED, you might be um, you might be a foot away, you might be two feet away even. You're gonna have to play with it and watch it carefully. You don't wanna fry those, and so you just have to keep an eye out. If you start seeing leaves turn a little bit of purple and they're not supposed to be, that's usually an overexposure to uh, light, so keep an eye out for that. So weak seedlings need more light. The dying off at soil level is probably one of the most common problems and it is sort of heartbreaking. Um, this is called damping off and it's sort of the dreaded seed starting disease, right? So it's actually caused by a fungus um, or a mold, but it, it typically thrives in cold, wet conditions. So, and, and this fungus is brought in, sometimes it's brought on by fungus gnats, sometimes it's by splashing water from one area to another because it can spread. And it's often found in garden soil, so that's why it's important to always use a sterile mix for seed starting because you don't want to introduce a fungus like that. So seedlings are particularly susceptible to this damping off um, when they're relatively young and just, you know, when they just have maybe one or two sets of true leaves. So anything that makes them grow slower will increase the chances that you're going to have an issue with damping off. So this is why you want to make sure they have the right temps and the right light because as long as you get them, keep them growing, they get past a stage where they're super prone to this damping off issue. So how do you prevent it from the get-go? Well, first of all, be clean. Anything, you, you really should wash all your seed starting stuff very well. We're going to get into that too. Um, ahead of time, you probably, anything that certainly has had this issue, you really want to make sure you, you clean that. Use a heat mat or a heat source of some kind to make sure that things aren't too cold, especially when they're going through the germination. And um, you have to check the ambient temperature too, and you might have to adjust that a little bit. And then you want to water. When you water, use warm water. Don't use don't use cold water. That's no good. And don't add any fertilizer until they have a few sets of true leaves, because fertilizer early fertilizing and the salts that are in fertilizer can also lead to damping off. Now, one of the things you might have heard is that cinnamon can prevent damping off. Uh, so I looked, there is no scientific evidence to back this up. There is a lot of anecdotal evidence to back this up. Cinnamon, and I believe it's Ceylon, Ceylon cinnamon in particular, has antifungal properties. So that is what that's about. You can try it. Like I said, there is no scientific there's no scientific information that suggests that that works, but there is there is anecdotal information. So if you feel like trying it out, spending a little bit of money to put um, cinnamon on the top of your soil 
it might help you and it might not. I think the number one key thing to preventing damping off is don't overwater. When do you take the plastic dome off the tray? Do you need a heat pad? Do you water from underneath or above? My main problem is that I can't get the, I can get the seeds to germinate, but then they die off at soil level. Well, again, that's a damping off issue, but let's just address those first couple of questions in there, which is the dome. So I do use a, a dome. Um, that creates a nice, warm, humid environment, um, sort of cozy for seedlings to get going. And what I do is I watch them come up. Once they germinate, I crack the cover to get some air going in there. And then once they come up just a little bit more, then I take the cover off altogether. If you have a tray in which you are growing multiple kinds of seedlings, then you're going to have to sort of because of course they will germinate at different rates. You'll have to sort of adjust. I think it's more important to make sure there's good airflow in there once those seedlings are up than it is to leave that cover on there. So I err on the side of more airflow than less airflow if I'm dealing with a mixed tray. Okay, now a whole bunch of questions that essentially come down to watering. Mine germinate, but I always struggle with watering. Um, how do I keep the green mildew mold, whatever it is from developing at the germination seedling stage, mold, my nemesis, how crucial is it to bottom water, um, how often do you water the seedlings and how much? Okay, good questions here because watering is what I would say, you know, right up there with one of the number one mistakes that people make, which is overwatering. So first off, I always err on the side of underwatering rather than overwatering. I find that in over, it is almost impossible to bring an overwatered seedling back from the brink. If you see things going a little south when, from underwatering, you've got a little bit of time to try to correct that situation. So err on the side of underwater because you cause a lot more problems with overwater. As for the green that you're finding on top, that's generally like LJ. And anytime you see LJ or fungus gnats, it's a pretty good sign that you're overwatering. Things are just too damp. So bottom watering is, in my opinion, by far the best way to water seedlings. Now, when you first plant things, you want to start with a moist soil, uh, potting soil mix. So make sure your potting soil is pre-moistened. And then you don't have to do much except maybe a little spritz of water on the top just to make sure that seed is settled in there. But once you're starting with pre-moistened soil mix or potting seed starting mix um, and just a little bit of water, you won't need to water for a little bit. Don't think you're going to probably have to, once you put a dome on, you probably won't have to water those until after they germinate unless it's something that takes a really long time to germinate. So some of the other benefits with bottom watering is that you never have to worry about washing a seedling away. It's not going to move. And if you've got soil that has been pre-moistened, it just acts as a wick and it just sucks it up. Um, those roots will go down. It, I think it encourages root, root growth on seedlings. So those roots will grow, go down. Um, to go find that water, you'll get good root, de root development and you won't have that invitation to issues on the top. Now the other thing I do is I also use a thin layer of vermiculite. I do it on all of my seedlings. Um, some people just do it on some varieties. I do it on everything whether I'm growing in a cell or a soil block or a pot. I will put a light sprinkle of the fine vermiculite not the the kind of crunchier stuff but a fine vermiculite on top which helps keep a barrier of moisture there um, so that that helps a little bit with the bottom watering, but it doesn't allow that LJ and stuff to form. If I'm growing uh, in a soil block, I usually wait until the very top of that looks a little bit dry before I add more water. And then I just pour it into, you know, I, I put everything into a solid tray. Whether it's a cell or not, it goes into a second solid tray and I just pour the water into the bottom of that tray and it sucks it up. I would like to know how you set your expectation on germination rate last year. I think my expectation was too high and it felt like I failed coming out of the gate due to lack of germination. So most packages have German rate germination rates written on them. Typically, they're going to be like over 90%. Some things that are a little harder, you might see lower. But keep in mind that there are things that affect a German rate germination rate, like age and how that seed was stored. Typically, fresh seed has better germination rates. Um, and so there are things that affect that. In almost every case, I plant two seeds per cell or soil block 
knowing that I will have to go back later on and thin one out. So that's how I solve that germination issue. If I'm dealing with something where the seed is very expensive or I don't have a lot of it, then I will just plant one per cell and cross my fingers. Okay, we also had a lot of questions about hardening off and potting on or potting up. I like potting on, but you call it what you like. Okay, so you start a seed in seed starting mix. This is a very fine mix that has very few nutrients in it because it's not necessary at that time. But they get big enough that they A, fill up that cell and need to move on, but B, they need more nutrients. And that's why you move them onto something with a regular potting mix, um, preferably without fertilizer built into it. And that gives them room for their roots to spread out and develop. So the question you're probably asking is, why not just start with a big pot with regular potting mix in it? Well, some seeds that grow quickly and develop quickly, I actually do do that for. So annual vines is one. They are heavy feeders. They grow very quickly. There's no need to mess around with the other things. And the main thing not for that I think is to why it's not a good idea to start a seed in a big pot is that it's very, very hard to get the watering right. In order to get the soil evenly moistened, there's so much water in that pot that it can be too much water for a seedling. So by starting out small, you're able to control the water situation much better than if you were starting in like a big pot. Okay, hardening off. Hardening off is the process of acclimatizing a plant to where it's going to be growing eventually. And it's a process you want to do very slowly. Think about maybe 10 days for most seedlings to get um, adjusted to where they're going to be growing. And you want to take it very slow. So every day you do another little step towards that process. And it's a total pain in the butt. And it's something we all want to rush. And you can't do it because you could lose everything. So the first day you take those seedlings, which are used to a certain temperature and a certain amount of light, and you take them outside in a warm day and you maybe cover them up with some shade cloth and you put them out at not the brightest part of the day for maybe an hour and then you bring them in. And then the next day you maybe put them out for two hours in that same spot, still covered. Um, and then you bring them in. And then the next day you move them into gradually more sun and gradually different temperatures. And you do this over a period of 10 days, and then they're all hardened off and they're ready to go into your garden or wherever they're cut. I've had success with vegetables, but not flowers. What is the trick to starting flowers? I don't think you actually have a problem starting flowers in general. I think it's that most vegetables seem to be much, I think vegetables are a bit easier to start from seed. There's less specifics that each thing needs. Some flowers need really special care. Some flowers need stratification. Some flowers need um, a certain temperature to grow the entire time. So I think it's just important that when you're growing flowers is do a little research and find out what that flower wants and then you'll have success with it. So when you're doing your research, um, I rely on a couple of books. This is a book that is no longer in print, but I found it um, on Amazon used. This is basically a reference guide of um, every flower I think you can possibly find in North America or most of them that will give you cultural information on how to grow them, start them, etc. Another um, really good reference guide is um, Matt Mattis's uh, The Art of Flower Gardening. But, you know, don't discount Google and the back of the seed packet too. What I do is I make a spreadsheet with all the information in it that I need to know so that I'm not looking it up every single time and then I carry that spreadsheet over from year to year. What and when do I feed my babies before I send them out into the big bad world? Um, okay, last year I did not feed my seedlings enough. I noticed that I, I had some really good growing plants and then things were not doing well and I know it was because I didn't feed enough. I'm I'm, I feed less than, than, well, clearly than I should, but less than most people. And so this year I'm going to be better about doing that. Um, I think the thing to do is think liquid fertilizer and think organic because organic fertilizers, generally speaking, are a little easier and harder to overdo on plants. And then you take the back of the bottle or whatever, and you dilute whatever the dilution they say you should use, dilute it down to like 25% of that. It is far better to go lighter on the fertilizer than it is to go heavy on the fertilizer because it's another thing that can wipe seedlings out. I don't start fertilizing until there's 
a, at least a few to several sets of true leaves on the plant. Now, when I say true leaves, I mean the very first leaves that pop up when you grow a seedling are what they call seed leaves or cotyledons. Um, they kind of all look the same. It's very hard to tell what a plant is from the seed leaves. And then those will eventually die off and you'll start getting the true leaves that will stay with your plant. So once you have a few sets of those true leaves, then it's probably time to start fertilizing a little bit. If you start seeing things go a little off color, maybe a little yellow, and you know you don't have a watering problem, um, then it's probably a good sign that you need a little bit of fertilizer too. Okay, two questions from very different areas. Um, one, I'm a newbie and I want to be a serious gardener living in zone nine. I was wondering what seeds I should be thinking of starting now. What do I have the best chance of success with? And then I'm in 5B and I am always afraid of starting them too early. If the seed packet says eight to 10 weeks before last frost, what do you recommend? Okay. So funny that those two questions would be there, but the key is, first of all, I will say starting seedlings too early is my number two biggest mistake that people make after watering. Uh, because once again, imagine that seed train, keep it moving, don't make it slow down. What you wanna do is when you're doing your research on your plant, check your seed packets for information. This information is almost always on them. If not, do a little bit of research. And you need to count back from your average frost date. Um, so now, average frost dates are specific to where you live. They are not specific to your zone. My average frost date is two to three weeks after many of the places in my zone. So I'm going to leave a link in the description, and I'll try to put it at the bottom of the screen here too, where you can go to look that up. There's a lot of other places. You can also Google last average frost date with your zip code see what happens. You should find the information. I will also put a link to a chart of this um, where you can find that information as well. Then what you do is you pull out your calendar. I like an old-fashioned paper one for this and I count back the weeks. So if it says starting inside eight weeks before your last average frost date, you count back eight weeks and that's when you should be starting your seeds. And that holds true regardless of if you're growing in zone nine or you're growing in zone five. And by all means, never underestimate the power of calling up your local um, Extension Master Gardener group um, or checking out their webpage for information that would be specific to your zone. Okay, lots of questions about pinching. What we should be pinching, when we should be pinching, how we should be pinching, and how that differs from thinning out. Okay, so thinning is the process of removing extra seedlings in a cell, which you do so that you have one really good plant instead of a whole bunch of kind of average to bad plants. And we do this because as we went back to the germination thing, a lot of times we plant extra seeds in a cell so that you make sure that you have good germination so you at least get one. When it comes to thinning, you have to sort of play plant god a little bit here. And you have to pick which one is better. I generally aim for ones that have thicker stems and are a little bit shorter if there's one that has better color. Sometimes it's a total crapshoot and you just go for it and pick one. I rarely try to tease out the other seedling unless there's a lot of room between the two seedlings because what you can do is you can damage the other seedling in the process of doing that and now you've ruined two seedlings. So what I do is I take um, a scissors or a really sharp um, or like a really sharp little pruner and I get in there and I just nip it off at ground level. So that way, and it, don't worry, those roots are just gonna go away very quickly in there and leave plenty of room for the other one. I know it's hard, I'm telling you, they're, they don't have feelings, they don't care. Okay, pinching. Pinching is an important part in the, that was a lot of peas. Pinching is an important part of the process. Uh, we do this to create bushier, fuller plants that will likely have more flowers on them, especially in the case of flowers or more fruits on them. So most plants will benefit from pinching. The exception is plants that create like a head or grow uh, or that you wanna grow on a single stem. So something with a head would be like a cabbage or if you wanna grow your tomatoes on a single stem, um, if you pinch them, they will create two branches. Um, sunflowers, delphiniums, those are examples of things you should not be pinching. Again, if you need to know, you can Google that to figure out whether pinching is beneficial or not. When you pinch, you're going to pinch back to, and, and literally it's called pinching because it works really good. If you just use your fingers, once again, you can use a uh, sharp little scissors or whatever too. But you just go in there and you want to pinch right above a set of leaves. 
So typically like sweet peas, for instance, I will let them grow a little bit and then I pinch back to, usually I pinch back to about three true leaves. Um, after they have four or five leaves, I'll pinch it back to three leaves. And then what happens is at that point, it will create a, a branch. So you'll get, now you'll have two shoots coming out from there. And if you pinch those again, you'll have two more shoots. So this is how a plant bulks up. Some things like basil respond really well to this and that's how you get these huge basil plants. I'd like to know which plants are best suited for direct sowing versus seed starting. Um, maybe what not to start as well as things that are good to start ahead. So once again, I mean, not to sound like a broken record here, but go to your seed packs. Almost every seed pack will tell you um, directions for starting ahead of time or direct sowing. Many will tell you which one is better for the plant because some plants just don't want to be started ahead of time or there's no real benefit to starting them ahead of time. So do your research, check the back of your seed packets, and then um, pay attention to that. You know, honestly, I mean, technically speaking, just about anything can be direct sowed. I mean, this is how plants happen without humans around, right? But the reason we would start things ahead of time is because um, we want to monitor those plants a little more, baby them a little more, protect them from the elements a little bit more, or more likely, like for me, um, you just don't have a long enough growing season that if you started them from seed, you wouldn't have a like in here, if you planted a tomato seed in the ground, you're not going to have tomatoes until very, very, very late here and maybe not at all. Same thing with sweet peas. So this is why we start these things ahead of time is to get that jump on the season. Okay, for seeds that can be direct sown, for seeds that can be direct sown, how do you make sure they don't get washed away in rain, especially ones that need light to germinate and can't be covered up? Uh, this is actually a really good question. I would say, especially like the one that comes to mind for me is lettuce. So lettuce, you know, you just, you just like want to sort of put, like make sure it's got good contact with the soil and that's it. But those little seeds are like bottle corks. They will up and float away if you water too much. So, um, you know, I would say, A, check the weather. A lot of those things that need light to germinate don't take too long to germinate. So check the weather. Um, you might be able to uh, put like a layer of um, really thin shade cloth over the top of them to prevent the rain from creating big pools and washing them away. Or you might even have to set up some sort of structure over the top of them to keep that from happening. So next up is equipment. Uh, Carol would like to know the pros and cons of using soil blockers versus plastic trays versus peat pots. Um, and tips for the best way to use uh, grow lights. So I do grow a lot of things using soil blocks. I quite like that. Um, so a soil block, if you're not familiar, is um, a situation where you mix up kind of a blend of soil and you put it into this little, you know, um, form and you push it out and you have four little blocks. Imagine um, for anyone who grew up up north, we used to have um, igloo makers where you could pound a bunch of snow into like a brick form and then you could make an igloo with it or am I dating myself? I'm not sure if they still have those. You get the idea. The pros of soil blocks is that they're very healthy for seedlings because um, they have good airflow around them. They air prune the roots. The roots are not going to ever grow out the edges um, so they won't ever and they just sort of stop growing. You won't get like circling roots more than likely in a soil block. Um, good airflow. It's very easy to pot them on because all you have to do is make the hole that you need in the size pots you want to and plunk that thing right in there. It goes really quick. And one of the things that I like best is that if you have a whole tray of soil blocks and you have a bunch of them where the seeds just didn't germinate, you can pull those out. And you can just reuse that soil compost. I reuse that soil, um, not for seed starting, but when I'm potting things up. And so you're not wasting room in trays. And then, of course, the other you know, kind of big thing with soil blocks is it's one less probably plastic pot in this world. Now, the cons are that it's more gear to buy. You got to buy that soil block or it's just more stuff to invest in. Um, you have to mix the soil. Uh, so it's like extra time and extra step. And it's more, and because of that, it takes longer. Now, plastic trays, you know, the pros with that, I would say, is that they're super simple. They're easily accessible. You can pick them up anywhere, and they are reusable. Um, when I buy plastic trays now, I try to buy actually more expensive ones because they tend to be thicker gauge plastic, and I'll be able to use them for more years. If I have to buy plastic anyways, at least I'm going to use it as long as I can. Um, the cons are... 
it's more plastic in this world, although it's almost impossible to avoid plastic in the plant world right now anyways. And then you run into some of those issues that you might run into um, that you have solved using soil blocks. And then peat pots, I mean, the pros are that they might be, I guess they're more environmentally friendly than plastic, but keep in mind there are issues with peat. Um, they are compostable and they're expensive. Um, the cons are that in my experience, you gotta take those things off anyway. I don't know about you guys, let me know what your experience has been. My experience has been that anytime I use any of those pots, including um, what are the ones that are made out of manure, any of those, I plant something, if I plant those in the ground, they're still there when that plant's dead at the beginning of the year. They never really break down that fast. So there's that. So the best way to use grow lights is to make sure you have the right distance for them and then put them on a timer. 16 hours a day is what I do. Um, let them have a break for eight hours a day, but 16 hours a day uh, is kind of the standard, I think, for most things. I don't wanna buy grow lights. Can I still sow seeds indoors and get them to germinate and grow? And the answer is maybe. If you have a very sunny window, it very well might work, but even a cheap, simple grow light will help. Keep in mind, grow lights can be very simple. A fluorescent shop light, works as a grow light. You can also buy these little grow lights that are just little clamps that have like a bendable arm. I actually have some of those for some of my house plants. And if you just have one tray in front of a window, that might be all the extra light you need if you want to do that. However, I would say um, we're going to get into winter sewing in a little bit here, but if you don't have grow lights or want grow lights, I think you should think hard about doing some winter sowing. Uh, next question. As a new gardener with limited experience, I've not had great success starting seeds indoors. I don't have the space or lighting. I do have an unheated north-facing Florida rooms. Any ex suggestions on how to use this space? Uh, this is not an answer I like to give, but I would say don't use that space for seed starting. None of that sounds very promising to me. Uh, seeds need heat and light, and an unheated room in a north-facing window doesn't seem that conducive to that. I don't want to spend a ridiculous amount of money on seed starting soil. Would it be okay to sift a potting mix to get that fine quality? Yeah, I think it would be fine. I, I think most things will do fine in that, but just make sure you buy one that doesn't have a fertilizer built into it because those will burn little seedlings. Okay, Denise, first time for me this year, I have a grow light, heat pad, two trays. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to try. I would say, Denise, sounds like you are good to go. Give it a shot. I think you'll enjoy it. How important is a heat mat for germination? So generally speaking, you need some bottom heat uh, for most seedlings. Most seedlings have a range at which they will not germinate if they do not have that temperature. That temperature is typically between like 70 and even 80 sometimes with 70 and 75 degrees um, for most things. So if you can't give them that, they're never, it doesn't matter what you do, they're not gonna germinate. But keep in mind that a lot of seeds don't need light to germinate, so you can find that heat somewhere else. Think about the top of your refrigerator, uh, top of a radiator, any place where you have some warm spot just to get some bottom heat on there so that you have that soil at that right temperature. Okay, Hadley says, can I start seeds in a cold frame in my garage or porch if I have a little heater in it? What's the cheapest but still effective way to start seeds? Um, can I put them in something they won't have to transplant up inside before potting them in the ground? Okay, so if we're talking about a true cold frame here, which is essentially something that is glass or clear plastic over a bit of soil, um, you can create a seed bed actually right in that cold frame. And from there, you'll be able to transplant things to their final spot. So that's something you can do. Um, you're gonna have to be a little careful about what you start in there. We're gonna get into winter sowing. Anything that would be appropriate for that would would work there as well. Oh, and you won't need, don't you don't need to mess around with the heater if you're talking about a true cold frame. What is the best way to clean my seed trays from last year? Uh, this is one of those things that is a do as I say, not as I always do, but I am getting better about it. Use a bleach solution about um, one part bleach to 10 parts water. Soak them in hot water. Bathtub works great for this. Soak them in hot water for about 10 minutes. Um, finish with a little bit of wash with um, water and dish detergent and then just rinse them off and let them dry. Jeff says, I'd like to do some seed starting, but I don't even know what sort of things I could start easily at home with no real setup, no grow lights, etc. etc. List easy plans would, would be helpful. So I think this is really an important question because I think we get so caught up in the gear involved in growing that, and I do too, I'm totally guilty of this, um, that 
we forget that there are simpler ways to do this. So actually what I would recommend is thinking about winter sewing. If you don't have grow lights, like we've talked about, it's very hard to get enough light from a window. So think about the winter sewing method. This is um, where you sew essentially in milk jugs. We're gonna go into that in more detail, but I think you'll have more success doing that than you will trying to really force the issue um, in a situation if you don't have a grow light. But it doesn't mean that you can't grow. So Roxanne says, I just bought a collapsible greenhouse like yours. I wanna know, um, I wanna know how much I can do out there with a little heater at night in the way of seed starting. Okay, so I don't use my little, I have a little portable collapsible greenhouse. Um, I'll put a link to it. I don't even know if it's available right now. It seems to go in and out of stock, but I'll put a link to the concept of it um, in the description. I don't use that for seed starting at all. What I use that for is hardening things off and it works great for that. Okay, let's get into winter sewing. Uh, Shauna wants to know if I've ever tried winter sewing in containers, pros and cons. So a quick, a quick primer on winter sewing. Winter sewing, as I just said, is where you use some sort of jug or container and you essentially cut the top off it, you put some soil in it, you poke some holes in the bottom of it, put soil in it, sprinkle your seeds in there, close it back up, leave the top open, stick it outside in the weather. Uh, so, so what are the pros and cons of winter sewing? Well, let's start with um, cost. It is, I'm gonna say, other than direct sewing, the cheapest way to sow a seed. You know, you don't have to mess around with lights, you don't have to mess around with plants in your house. Um, you know, I think a big thing to point out is that it's sort of set it and go for most people. Keep in mind that if I can't go on a vacation in the middle of seed starting season because of the situation I have created for myself. Because those seedlings need attention at least every other day, if not every day. So I have to find someone who knows how to grow plants to come in. So if that is not the kind of lifestyle you wanna lead, um, first of all, you're far more sane than I am. And B, winter sowing is a perfect alternative to that. The other thing is far less chance of damping off with winter sowing. And best off, you don't have to harden them off. Your plants are hardened off right in there and you don't have to worry about potting on. They just grow right in their little milk jug until the day it's time for them to go in the garden. So the cons, well, I would say it's difficult to do with some plants. Some plants are far better suited to winter sowing than other plants are. Anything that's um, sort of tropical um, or or very tender, um, you have to you have to play around with that a little bit. Um, because that's going to be a harder thing. Any seed that likes cold temperatures or requires stratification or if you think of a plant that reseeds easily in your own garden, that's a perfect plant to think about winter sowing. And I would also say that winter sowing takes a bit of experimentation. And that goes back to your first question of do I do it? And the answer is yes, I do a little bit of every year of it every year. And no, I don't do any videos on it because I don't feel like I have it I'm, I'm still experimenting with it myself. I don't have it nailed enough to go be telling you guys how to do it. Fortunately, there are a lot of people who do, and I will put links to some excellent videos on winter sewing and information online to winter sewing if you're interested in more of it, um, because those people have, have very good success with it. I'm in 5B. I don't really have enough space for seed starting indoors, but I want to try winter sewing, but I'm really worried about weather and critters. Don't worry about it. You're in the perfect place. I'm in zone five, works fine for me. I have never once had a problem with a critter winter sewing. I'm going to milk jug winter sow. Will I have to repot or can I leave it in the jug until the temperature is right for them to be planted in the ground? That's the best part. You don't ever have to move them on. Uh, the tip I have for you, which is one I need to take, is do not over sow. Um, I jam an entire pack of seeds into one of those jugs sometimes and that won't work. So you do need space in there because once they get going, you want them to keep going. Can you talk about winter sowing for zone four? It's my first time trying it and I would like to know when to start tomatoes, peppers, etc. Okay, so okay, so the two plants you just named are tricky because peppers and tomatoes want heat. In zone four B, I wouldn't start those in a milk jug in the winter sowing method until the end of March. And then don't pay attention to what's happening in the rest of the world because you're gonna have cold a lot longer than anybody else. Now, it can be done. Personally, I wouldn't do it. I just feel like I just feel like it might not be worth it. On the other hand, it's what's a couple of seeds cost if you wanna play around with it. You can always go, if it doesn't work, you can always go buy peppers and tomato plants. In any case, things like that start later because they're just going to, it's gonna to be too cold for them in those containers 
if you start them like now when you might start other things uh, winter sowing wise. Okay, so Roxanne says, I have zinnia seeds saved from flowers last year. When can I start planting those? Can they be winter sowed in milk jugs outside in late winter? So with zinnias, zinnias are the perfect seed to direct sow. You're not going to gain anything from winter sowing them. They won't really like that. They could freeze out anyway. So um, just hang on to them and sow them, direct sow them in the garden when the soil temperature and the air temperature are 70 or above. So this is going to be one of the last flowers that you plant in the garden for direct sowing. Lorelei says, what seeds would you recommend for your specific zone? I'm in the same zone, that's zone five again. Uh, for winter sowing, even if I'm not doing it this year. So the one plant that I have actually very good luck winter sowing is, and I always do it that way because I don't have good luck with it otherwise, is uh, Verbena banariensis. And that's the sort of drumsticky looking thing. But perennials do really well in there. I have um, good luck with biennials in there. Foxglove, uh, uh, Angelica, Salvia argentia, things like that. Delphiniums, poppies, uh, snapdragons, kale, cabbage, things like that. Again, look for those seeds that like a bit of cold and they're probably gonna do really well in winter sowing. I've seen a lot of gardeners use milk jugs to start seeds. Um, can I use 16.9 ounce bottle, water bottles the same way? If the water bottles work once seedlings appear, do I need to repot them? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, yeah, you can, you can use any container that is clear or opaque. I mean, a little bit opaque. I, I guess the rule is you wanna see your hand through it. That is over there. So you could absolutely use those little 16.9 ounce water bottles if you have a ton of those. What I would say though is keep in mind that most of those are only about that big. So you're looking at you know, just a few seeds in each one. No reason you can't do it. They'll just keep the number of seeds in there um, down to a reasonable level. Okay, last group of questions. This is sort of about specific plants and some design elements. I collect black-eyed Susan seeds, Rosa Sharon seeds, etc. cetera, um, from my garden and I wanna try growing this out this year. Uh, I think I'm supposed to put them in the freezer for three weeks or refrigerator and then I need to, do I need to soak them? So, yeah, so some seeds and often some of these perennials that you're talking about do want a cold period, which is called stratification. And there are different ways to stratify seeds. Um, and sometimes they're specific to a plant. Something like Rebecca, for, in for instance, wants a long stratification period. They would like three months in the fridge. And so what you do is you take about a quarter cup of sand and you just mix the seeds in there, put the whole thing in a plastic bag and then throw it in the corner of your refrigerator for three months. Um, Cause they want 40 degrees for their stratification period. So Keep that in mind, look it up specific to each plant that you're looking for and then do that. Okay, Sharon says she just bought strawberry seeds. How, when, how deep in a container? Wait, what do I do with them? Uh, I grew um, a whole bunch of plants from, um, strawberries from plants two years ago. That was quite fun. I had never done that before. The first thing to know is that strawberry seeds may need cold stratification. The strawberries I grew did not need to be stratified, so I didn't do that. So the information I found um, from Strawberry Growers Association um, was to stratify in the freezer for about a month. Now, strawberry seeds take a long time to grow, so you're going to want to get those babies in the freezer right now because um, they're going to have to be in there for a month, and then you're going to get them out. They do require light to germinate, so you're going to want them just on the top of the soil. Um, you can still put that thin layer of vermiculite on top of there, uh, like I spoke about earlier, but you just want to make sure they have good contact with the soil. Don't cover them with soil because, you know, they're such tiny little seeds. And then you have to be a little patient. They're going to take they're going to take between one and six weeks to germinate, which is an awful long range to sit around and wait. And then they're going to grow on for probably another six to eight weeks before they're going to be of a size that you can get them in the garden. So Jennifer says, I harvested flower seeds from my gardens this fall. Good for you, Jennifer. I wish I should have, I should have done more of that. Um, but I'm stumped about what should be started indoors and which should be scattered when the soil is warm enough. Um, so once again, just, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record here, but Google it. Check the library for one of these great books or Google it because each type of flower needs something different. There's no there's no overarching thing I can tell you that will apply to every flower. Here's someone says, I always have trouble starting snapdragons. They seem to germinate amazingly, but the seedlings seem to uh, not grow for so long. Is that a common thing or just my seedlings? I think this might be sort of a general seedling issue rather than something specific to snapdragons. So just make sure they've got that light they need. Um, 
and you just make sure you're following all that information about heat and planting instructions. Lindsay says, you have such a good eye for aesthetic in the garden. Oh God, thank you, Lindsay. That's kind of you to say that. I'm still a noob, but uh, just following the seed packet recommendations has left gaps and stunted growth because of overcrowding. Um, it's so hard to create a beautiful bed slash container garden without experience to know which each mature plant would become. Yeah, you know, that's still an issue for me. Absolutely. I mean, I never feel like I, I understand how to really grow a plant until I've grown it for a couple of years at least, which is why I often don't make videos on plants the first time I'm growing them because I don't want to give bad information and I need to try out some of these things for myself. So first of all, know that I think that that's not you. That's common to everybody. Keep in mind that when they say how big a plant will get, how you want your garden to look, I almost always space plants closer together than would be indicated by the full size of the plant because I can always pull a plant out. It's a little harder to fill in a hole later on, but you're right. There's a disadvantage to this, which is that by trying to pack in a ton of plants, you can sacrifice all of them and then none of them really look good. So you definitely don't want to super overcrowd things. One of the things you want to think about is that is where you're finding the information from. So keep in mind that like cut flower growers will often plant closer together, plant plants closer together because what they want is long stems because they want nice long stems to put in a vase. And by planting plants a little bit closer than they should be, what happens is plants reach a little bit for the sun. So if you're trying to get a little bit of a taller plant, sometimes you can accomplish that by planting things a little closer together. So just keep in mind a little bit of where that's coming from. And yeah, it is going to be a bit of an exp of experimentation for sure. And I mean, that's kind of what makes it fun, right? Okay, so Emily says, I would love to know which perennials you've grown from seed that worked out as well as plants you purchased as starts. I have some big areas to fill up and starting from seed would help the budget, but I don't want it to look like a garbage fire either. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is a good point because of course, um, perennials take their time. They have a perennial. So it takes them a while to get developed. So I would say as long as you're willing to be a little bit patient and remember, you're going to have to keep up with the weeding in between. Echinacea, some biennials like Angelica, Foxglove, Salvia Argentia, all of those are things that I think do really well when you start them from seed. Your best path to um, getting like a full look in your garden might be to invest in a couple perennials, let them grow a little bit, and then divide them in successive years to fill out your stock of them. And in those uh, early years when you're growing on, you can just throw some, show, throw some direct sow seeds in there for annuals. And that fills in the gaps, keeps the weeds from coming in there while your perennials are getting established. Sonoma says, would you recommend starting lavender from seed or buying potted plants? I want to line our 100 foot fence with lavenders with a $100 to $200 budget. I would love to hear how you would plan for that. I believe that growing lavender from seed is not super simple and I think it takes a while to get those plants going. I have not personally tried it so correct me in the comments please. Uh, what I would do in your situation is I would spend my $100 to $200 budget buying as many lavender plants as you can find although I would look for like smaller pots of them um, either like what they would call a landscape plug if you can find somebody who sells those or like a small three inch or four inch pot of them spread those out, grow those, and then I would take cuttings from those plants because lavender uh, does well from cuttings. And so then you've got next to your stock and you can fill up in between there, knowing that you're not going to have that fence area looking exactly like you're envisioning it for probably three to five years. Susan says, have you tried Lysianthus from seed? I have not. However, um, Flower Hill Farm and Garden Answer have both recently, I think, done videos on growing um, on growing Lysianthus from seed. I'll put links to those videos below. Margaret says, I have some biennial seeds that I should have started some months ago. For example, a beautiful peach colored foxglove. Do you think I can start them now and still bloom this year? She's in the Netherlands. She said it's probably like zone 7B. Um, it depends on the variety. Some varieties have been bred to bloom uh, basically within a year. So the one that I always like is that does that is Dalmatian peach. So if the peach thing, if the peach color one that you have is Dalmatian peach, that will bloom this year if you plant it this year. Some of the other ones, um, yeah, you you might you might like at the end of the year you might get flowers out of them, but you never know. Personally, if it were me, I'd grow those seeds and plant them in the garden either way come spring, and if they don't bloom, they're gonna bloom next year. 
and then you got next year's gone. Thank you for sticking with it. I hope the chapters helped you get through this. If you have other questions on seed starting, like I said, leave them in the comments. If there's a whole bunch of them and you guys would like to see another one of these videos, let me know and we'll answer that. If not, I will try to answer them in the comments so that we can get you guys going. My, so my parting words on seeds is this. We are all worrying too much about it. I think more than any other part of gardening, seed starting is about experimentation. And I think that I can sit here and talk to you for probably another hour or however long this video is. And it still won't help you as much as just trying some out and see what happens. A pack of seeds costs a couple of bucks and you don't really have that much skin in the game usually other than, you know, your heart hurts a little bit if something goes wrong and your time. So experiment with it and have fun with it and let's not stress about it so much. And also the last thing is you don't need to grow for plants from seed to be a gardener. Okay, we'll see you soon guys.